Uh, good morning and good afternoon, everyone. I'm Greg Armstrong. I'm a software developer and physicist at Quantumall, and I'll be talking about how we plan to implement the effective core potential capability that Stenic has just described for heavy elements in our QEC uh, software. So first of all, what is QEC? So Quantumall Electron Collisions Software Package is a package which provides cross-sections for electron molecule collisions. It uh, interfaces with uh, two main codes. Firstly, the MOLPRO quantum chemistry package, which provides, amongst other things, uh, target uh, orbitals. Uh, and also the UKRMO plus codes, which Danix has just uh, described, which calculates cross-sections. Um, the purpose of the QEC uh, software itself is to provide a GUI interface for users where the user can input the main pertinent physical parameters that they require for their calculation. Uh, there are also uh, visualization aids to help the user set up the calculation. And uh, once these are input, the, the details from the GUI that the user has provided are then sent and used to construct input files for MOPRO and UKRMO Plus. And these codes are then run and cross sections are output. So they set of cross sections and rates that QEC will produce um, are as follows. So elastic scattering is provided by default. Uh, there are also, there's also momentum transfer cross section and rates. Uh, there are a range of excitation uh, cross sections that are output, electronic, rotational, and vibrational excitation cross sections. There is also a method within QEC to estimate the dissociative electron attachment cross section. And the code will also calculate ionization cross sections using the binary encounter beta method. Uh, this method will provide the total ionization cross section, but can also be extended to calculate partial ionization cross sections. So, in terms of doing calculations for heavy elements, um, the main issue at the outset is uh, MOLPRO. MOLPRO will provide all electron basis sets only for elements up to Krypton. Once you get beyond Krypton, it will use effective core potentials to handle some of the electrons in each atom in your system. Now, these potentials can handle up to all closed shells, leaving you only with valence shell electrons to actually treat explicitly. So it cuts down the computational demands in the calculations, as Denek described. Um, one of the main advantages of the uh, ECPs is that they can allow efficient capture of relativistic effects. So they include relativistic effects in their actual calculation originally, um, but at the same time, they cut down the costs on our calculations. So you're, you're gaining in terms of the physics that the calculations are described um, whilst cutting the cost, which is unusual. So UK OMO Plus now accounts for such potentials. And the actual implementation of this within QEC is currently being developed. That's a major part of my work. Um, and once this has been developed and tested thoroughly, uh, ECPs uh, will be made available and will be the main feature in the next uh, release of QEC. So how can this capability actually be activated by a user of QEC? So those of you who have used QEC before will be familiar with this screen. If not, then the, this is the window of QEC where the user can select the main parameters for the MOPRO calculation. And one of the main parameters is the basis set, which appears here on the right-hand side. And the user typically selects from a drop-down menu. Um, uh, until now, this drop-down menu contained all electron basis sets. And the plan is that this uh, drop-down menu will simply be extended uh, to account for ECP. Uh, basis sets. Um, and the information here is just the uh, MOLPRO library keyword for the basis set. And there's a particular class of basis sets, sometimes called the Stuttgart Cologne uh, class of basis sets, um, whose MOLPRO library keyword is of this form, ECP, and then a number, and then some letters afterwards, which are not as important. Uh, the number is quite instructive because that tells you how many electrons the core potential will handle. So the example I'm showing here is for the iodine molecule. And the basis set I've selected is called ECP46 MDF. So the 46 means that 46 electrons in each iodine atom are handled by a core potential. So that's up to 4010. 
that leaves you the seven n equals five electrons in the valence um, shell of each iodine atom to be treated. So if you use this core potential, I2 has 106 electrons, you'd be treating seven electrons of each explicitly. So you would reduce the problem for, from a 106 electron problem to a 14 electron problem, which would be quite helpful in terms of runtime. Um, so at the moment, uh, these basis sets have been implemented, this uh, Stuttgart group. There are other classes of ECPs which are available in MOPRO, such as the Los Alamos LANL 2DZ um, class of basis sets and, and some others. Um, their names are not as instructive. They don't tell you any of the characteristics of the, the calculation, how many um, electrons are handled by the core potential. Um, and some of them are a bit small. So it's not clear whether uh, these will be implemented in QEC. We may simply stick to the, to the Stuttgart ones, um, but that remains to be, to be seen. So in terms of a proof of principle of running QEC um, using ECPs, um, uh, I decided to take a case of bromine 2, just a homonuclear diatomic as a first case. And uh, although this is not particularly heavy, it is a case right on the edge of uh, the region of the periodic table where you can do a calculation using an ECP basis set and an all-electron basis set and compare. So you can do a calculation for bromine 2, which is a 70-electron calculation using a Dunning basis set, CCPVDZ, just a standard basis set. And there are also a range of ECPs for bromine. I've chosen to use a 28 electron uh, core potential. So that handles everything up to 3D electrons, leaving you with the N equals four, seven N equals four electrons in each bromine atom to be treated. Um, and this is the name of the, the basis uh, set in, in, in full using the 28 electron uh, core potential. So I reduced this from a 70 electron problem to a 14 electron problem. And I've calculated elastic scattering and electronic excitation cross-sections for this molecule. I run test calculations using uh, two different modes of running the R matrix calculations. So the static exchange and close coupling models. Uh, static exchange is just a method of running the R matrix calculations in which you neglect target polarization and target excitation. Uh, neglecting these things uh, means that it's not particularly physical, but it is good for testing because the calculations run quickly. Um, it means you can calculate an elastic scattering cross-section, but you can't account for target excitation. To do that, you use close coupling, which allows you to calculate uh, excitation cross-sections since it includes uh, multiple uh, target states of the molecule. So this is the first calculation that came out of the elastic scattering cross-section calculated using static exchange for bromine two. The blue curve is the all electron calculation and the orange dashed curve is the one with ECPs, um, the 28 electron core potential for each bromine. And we can see here some similarities and some differences. There are There is a, a slight difference um, at low energy. Mind you, I would note the scale on the y-axis here, this cross section, although it looks very sort of undulatory, it's relatively flat. Um, in general, but there is still a sort of maybe a 5% discrepancy here at low energy is what I'm finding and a smaller differences uh, further out. Uh, so aside from that, it looks reasonable, but this is worth investigation. So what I did is, as Denik had done, is to break down this total elastic scattering cross section into the various symmetries. So BR2 is treated um, as a member of the D2H point group. So you can break it down into the eight different irreducible representations and look at each um, uh, representation's contribution to the cross-section. This is the for AG. Um, again, solid curve is all electron, dashed curve is ECP. And there are differences here at low energy, and this probably explains most of the, the differences in the, in the total at low energy. Um, Again, just a few percent. Aside from that, there's good agreement at, at high energies. Uh, the source of this discrepancy, I should say, is not clear yet whether this is actually an effect of the basis or whether this is, is still some uh, problem in the implementation in QEC that's not quite right. Um, that, that remains to be investigated. But aside from this discrepancy down here, things look good. 
Um, what about other symmetries? So for, for B1U, things look, look excellent. There's good agreement across the board at all energies there between all electron and ECP. Similarly for B2U, some tiny differences maybe here at 9 EV or so, but otherwise this looks very good. B1G, it looks like there are differences here, but this made quite a small contribution to the overall cross-section. This generally looks, looks very good, uh, as does B2G and AU. There, there are some differences are visible, but again, the magnitude of the cross-section, this uh, symmetry is quite small. So I don't, I don't think these differences are particularly uh, significant. Um, so things look reasonably good there. Uh, I tested this also using close coupling, and this is just the this is again the total elastic scattering um, cross section with close coupling. And here we see some differences at low energy and some at high as well. Uh, but here we see some resonances coming in. So we get some resonances here at two eV and a couple here, which are reproduced quite well in both calculations, even if the magnitude is off here, these resonant features seem to be reproduced in both calculations um, really quite well. Um, but still some discrepancies are what, what I'm uh, finding at low and high energy. Um, so again, to break this down in, in its symmetries, uh, in AG, again, there is a, a difference at uh, low energy, but again, a resonance is found here and is, is uh, captured quite well in both calculations and good agreement at high energy. Uh, for B1U, things look excellent. B2U, there's some differences here, not particularly significant. This does not make a, it's not a small contribution to the cross section, but it's it's not huge either. And the, the resonance here is, is, uh, is, is captured well in both. B1G, there did seem to be some differences here. Although this makes quite a small contribution to the total cross section, there is a difference here. This peak is at about 1.75 square angstroms and this goes up to 2.5. And the, the difference increases even from low energy. Um, again, the, the source of this is not yet clear, whether this is an effect of the basis set or um, uh, some mistake in the implementation um, that remains to be seen but it is there and will be uh, investigated. B2G, things look, things look good. Um, they use some small differences, but again, this gives a very small contribution to the overall cross-section. There are some differences at, at high energies. And then calculated excitation cross-sections for uh, BR2. And so here, solid curves are the all-electron excitation cross-sections for various um, uh, excited states. The dashed curves of the same color are the ECP calculation. So the agreement here is, is really quite good. I think in all cases, this is just the first four excited states. There are higher excited states, but their cross-section um, diminishes uh, strongly. Um, everything looks pretty good here. There are some differences in, in magnitude, but these, these features um, um, are produced very well. Um, in both calculations, or they, they agree very well between the, the calculations. In addition to the cross section itself, we can look at the uh, vertical excitation energies uh, that were obtained in the two calculations. So these are the lists of uh, excited uh, target states and their vertical ex excitation energies in the all electron and ECP calculation agree very well, usually within 1%, 2% level. Um, which is, is very encouraging. Uh, in terms of the saving on runtime, when I ran both these calculations on the same machine, the all electron calculation took 124 minutes and the ECP calculation took 33. So there's a considerable saving um, there whilst getting uh, similar accuracy in the excitation cross sections. So this was kind of an early proof of principle uh, calculation to actually demonstrate a calculation for a, a truly heavy uh, system for which you would need to use ECPs. I've chosen I2, uh, where you can take a core potential to treat 46 electrons, as I mentioned earlier, in each iodine atom. Um, and that leaves you seven valence in each one. So it's a 14 electron problem instead of 106 that you would have to do should you be able to do an all electron calculation. And I've calculated elastic scattering and electronic excitation cross-sections. These are very preliminary, literally from this week, but this is the elastic scattering cross-section, 
which uh, looks reasonable. There are some resonant features coming in um, and we can see if there's any literature data that we can compare this to. And I also calculated excitation cross sections. Things look, look reasonably uh, good, but it would be good to see if there are any literature values for um, either for the cross sections or vertical excitation energies to try and see if these are, are, uh, are actually accurate. But the calculations are not possible. And again, these ran in, in, a, in a reasonable uh, time, less than, less than an hour. So in terms of future developments, um, I've restricted myself to homonuclear diatomics just for simplicity, since these are the very first calculations I've been doing with this. In general, users will want to use this for polyatomic molecules probably containing both a mixture of heavy and light elements. So uh, the QEC interface would need to be developed in order to allow the user to use ECPs for the heavy elements and the all electron basis sets for the lighter ones. Uh, at the moment, since I've been doing just uh, diatomics, I've used ECPs for everything, but uh, allowing the user to have this mixture is uh, the main uh, extra development that I'll be, that I'll be working on um, from now. And, uh, that is just a quick overview of our work on implementing ECPs in QEC. The real hard work on this project has been done by Stenek and his group, uh, Jakob and uh, Martin at uh, Charles University in Prague. So I thank them for all of their uh, hard work on this. And I'd like to acknowledge my colleagues also at Quantable working on cross sections. And thank you for your attention. Thank you, Greg. Uh, if anyone has any questions for Greg, please let us know. You have a few minutes to answer anything. Yes, Danik. Um, hello, um, I have just a, a quick comment uh, that uh, first of all, congratulate uh, you know the, um, Greg for 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 this nice results. Um, second of all, I think when you were showing this bromine two um, results, you were talking about these discrepancies between the ECP result and the CCPVDZ. Uh, I would just like to point out that it's not clear that we should be actually getting a, an, an agreement there because the CCPVDZ calculation is probably actually lower quality than the ECP because it got, the ECP basis contains a triple um, uh, valence zeta functions, whereas the all electron one is actually a smaller basis. So I would just say that it, it seems to me that there is no problem with, with the calculations with the ECPs and that they are possibly more accurate even than the all electron results. Okay. Um, do you think that should the all electron calculation be done with triple zeta just to make sure it's a... I mean, I think this would sounds. be a bit more fair comparison if such mm -hmm. a basis set is, uh, um, can be found. So that would be, that would be a, a better comparison. But yeah, I mean, I think essentially the calculations are fine. Thanks. And I think next is Oliver from Bramley from Quantum Hall. Hi. Morning. Um, so today I'm going to be talking about calculating the dissociation of TEOS. Um, so TOS is a molecule that I'm sure some of you uh, know. It's used as a precursor to deposit layers of silicon dioxide when um, making chips. Um, it's, it's already used and sort of similar molecules are already used in industry, but we actually don't really understand the mechanism uh, by which